A City on Mars, written by Kelly and Zach Wienersmith, and published by Penguin Press in November of 2023, with a snippet read by Richard Coombs. Available for checkout right now at the Alice Pendleton Library. Wherever you are on this planet, you've recently given some thought to leaving it. Space is looking more promising every day. There's no political corruption on Mars, no war on the moon, no juvenile jokes on Uranus. Surely, space settlement presents the best chance since about 50,000 BC to try out something completely new and leave all the bad stuff behind. After five decades of stagnation in human spacefaring, we now have the technology, the capital, and the desire to go beyond the age of quick forays to the moon and seize our destiny as a multiplanetary species. Well, maybe not. If you're like most of the non-experts we've talked to as we researched this book, you might have some ideas about space settlement that aren't quite right. We don't blame you. The public discourse around space settlement is full of myths, fantasies, and outright misunderstanding of basic facts. In 2020, for example, SpaceX's internet service provider, Starlink, released a Terms of Service Agreement that declared that no Earth-based government has authority or sovereignty over Martian activities. This clause is like many statements about outer space settlement. It was promoted by a powerful advocate, widely shared and commented upon, and profoundly misleading. Earth-based governments do have authority over Mars activities. Mars is regulated by long-standing treaties and is an international commons. Admittedly, the treaties are weird and vague, but they do exist and can't be de-existed via a terms of service agreement. Not all the bad space settlement discourse comes from rocket billionaires. Consider the 2015 Newsweek article, Star Wars' Class Wars, Is Mars the Escape Hatch for the 1%, which claims the red planet will likely only be for the rich, leaving the poor to suffer as Earth's environment collapses and conflict breaks out. The only way you could believe this would be if you had no idea how thoroughly, incredibly, impossibly horrible Mars is. The average surface temperature is about negative 60 degrees Celsius. There's no breathable air, but there are planet-wide dust storms and a layer of toxic dust on the ground. Leaving a 2 degrees Celsius warmer Earth for Mars would be like leaving a messy room so you can live in a toxic waste dump. The truth is that settling other worlds, in the sense of creating self-sustaining societies somewhere away from Earth, is not only quite unlikely anytime soon, it won't deliver on the benefits touted by advocates. No vast riches, no new independent nations, no second home for humanity, not even a safety bunker for ultra-elites. Yet we find ourselves in a world where space agencies, huge corporations, and media-savvy billionaires are promising something else. According to them, settlements are coming, perhaps as soon as 2050 or so. When they are built, they will fix just about everything. They will save Earth's biosphere, or enable a wildly creative frontier civilization, or provide huge economic advantages for the United States, or China, or India, or whoever else makes the first big move. While we believe all these claims are false, they are buoyed by genuinely game-changing technological developments that have made accessing space much cheaper. In the next decade, it will almost certainly be easier to build outposts in space than ever before. The problem for any would-be settler is that most of the problems, especially those pertaining to things like biology and economics, are far more complex than making bigger rockets or cheaper spacecraft. As we'll see, ignoring these problems while trying to force a near-term settlement is a recipe for social calamity and potential danger to the home planet. Meanwhile, the international legal structure that governs space have barely been updated since the 1970s. Space law is often vague, ambiguous, and if you accept the interpretation favored by the United States, highly permissive. 
In the modern world of fast-growing space capitalism and an ever-increasing number of countries with launch capability, we have the makings of a new moon race. But racing in the 2020s or 2030s will be very different from racing in the 1960s, in that it will likely involve attempts to gain priority access to the highly limited best portions of the moon. In terms of the risk conflict, it's much less like two kids seeing who can run the fastest, and much more like a growing group of kids scraping over a small pile of candy. That's dangerous. If we convince you that there's no clear return or investment here, then it's needlessly dangerous. Oh, and actually, let's ruin the metaphor here a little and make it so the kids also have nuclear weapons.